Courtney Price. I'm currently working at NASA Ames in the Tory Holder Lab under Alta Howells, and who is um, in the same office as Sanjoy, actually. And I'm currently a senior at UCLA studying microbiology, and I plan to go into this field in the future. So this has been really cool. And I'm going to be talking about the calcium and magnesium requirements in methanogens, and specifically in these alkalinic environments. So to begin, I want to give a little bit of an overview of the talk I'm going to give. So first, what exactly is methanogenesis in serpentinized fluids? These are some terms that might not be familiar with you, so I'll explain what these are exactly. And then I'll talk about the overarching goals of our research, where we're characterizing pH boundaries and CO2 requirements for these methanogens that we're studying. And then we're going to compare these interesting methanogens to methanogens um, that are previously characterized. Then I'll go over the problem that we're currently facing, where these methanogens, oh, sorry, it's not the chat. Okay. Um, where these methanogens may require magnesium and calcium, but um, the magnesium and calcium actually leads to precipitation, which causes a lot of issues with collecting data. And finally, the solution we uh, stumbled upon by using thermodynamic modeling to design a media that can avoid the precipitation via magnesium and calcium. So serpentinization is a interesting process that isn't extremely common on the crust of the earth. It is a subsurface water rock reaction with ultramafic rock from the upper mantle. So ultramafic is a type of igneous rock that um, exists below the crust. So typically it's not really on the surface of earth. It's only in little outcroppings that peek through the mantle. However, um, this is important for astrobiology research because many ultramafic rocks are prevalent on other worlds, such as Europa, Enceladus, and Mars, potentially not confirmed. But this process uses olivine or pyroxene in water to create serpentine, hydrogen, methane, and heat, which is important because the product of this reaction, um, one of them is methane, which is very useful for certain metabolic processes. So, why are we choosing to? look at this process in particular in Oman, like I said earlier. So a serpentinized fluid, which is a fluid um, above the serpentinized rock, is very hydrogen rich, highly alkaline, and extremely low CO2. So these don't, like at first glance, they don't really seem like perfect conditions for a microbe to grow, but there's recent evidence that methanogens can exist in these environments. And this is really, I talked about serpentinization because one of the products of serpentinization being hydrogen gas is a product for methanogenesis, which you can see below. So this water rock interface is directly tied to microbial growth. And it is a very simple type of metabolism that we don't really observe a lot on Earth, but they think that it could be a model metabolism for other environments that um, have serpentinized rock. So to give a little bit of an overview on methanogens, currently the majority of methanogens that we've characterized exist in marine and freshwater sediments. I'm gonna, can you guys see my mouse? Okay. So they exist in marine and freshwater sediments around pH 6.5 to pH 7. And in this graph, you can see that the x-axis is hydrogen and the y-axis is CO2, which are the two reactants for methanogenesis. So typically they exist at a high CO2 and a low hydrogen gas concentration. However, in typical culture conditions, we culture them at high hydrogen, high CO2, because that's where they're happiest. However, in serpentinized fluids, it's the opposite of how we've observed typical methanogens in previous research. So serpentinized fluid methanogens exist at very high hydrogen and low CO2, which is a little bit peculiar because CO2 is a very important reactant for this process to happen. It's also important to note that this graph is on a log scale, so the fold change is a lot more significant than a typical standard scale. So from typical methanogens that exist in freshwater sediments, such as methanobacterium, to serpentinized fluid methanogens in Oman, we're going to have to somehow incrementally get closer and closer to replicating these conditions to be able to study them. So there was a paper in 2018 published by one of our um, one of our associates, Dr. Hannah Miller, 
who characterized the NSHQ4 methanobacterium, who slowly characterized it closer and closer to the serpentinized fluid methanogen in Oman. And you can see that she, on the red dots, they lowered the CO2 content slowly in order to get it closer to true environmental conditions. So we use a lot of this work as a foundation for our research that I will go into now. So currently we have a big problem where it's very difficult to grow these methanogens because um, one, the H2 and CO2 requirements are very different than previously understood conditions. And also these specific methanogens have a lot of calcium magnesium in their surrounding media due to just environmental conditions where these rocks exist. However, the calcium and magnesium at high pH can actually lead to precipitation of the dissolved inorganic carbon in the surrounding environment. So as you can see in the graph on the bottom left with pH on the x-axis and mole percentage on the y-axis, um, there is a concentration of carbon dioxide, but as the pH increases, this concentration goes down and is replaced by calcium carbonate, which does not necessarily it, it can't be used as a reactant for methanogenesis, which leads to a lot of confounding variables. And you can see that the bicarbonate concentration is also going down, which leads to a lot more complications that we don't fully understand yet. And since the rate of methanogenesis is expected to depend on the concentration of CO2, given that CO2 is a reactant for methanogenesis, this is a big problem because the concentration of the reactants in a solution is drastically changing if you change the pH. So we can't really fully understand exactly how these guys grow just yet. So we took the data from the previous paper that I was discussing and we analyzed it at various pHs. And you can see in the blue, this is where precipitation is favored. So at pH 9.53, for example, dolomite, aragonite, and magnesite are favored in formation. And for instance, dolomite is a magnesium calcium mineral compound which goes to show that calcium and magnesium are precipitating in the solution and leading to potential experimental um, confounding variables. So to summarize this, this might be a lot of new information. Alkaline conditions are very favorable for carbonate precipitation, but this introduces a lot of variables that, that we don't really have the means to account for. So when precipitation is present, the concentration of CO2 is variable. And this adds a layer of complexity due to multiple growth variables. So to combat this, our desired chemistry is we want to hold carbon dioxide constant and vary the amount of dissolved inorganic carbon as pH changes so we can avoid precipitation from occurring. As a result, we can eliminate these variables that I've been discussing. We can isolate a very specific variable such as pH or other variables such as magnesium or calcium concentration. It makes the research a little more streamlined and straightforward. So to do this, we are using a type of thermodynamic modeling system called EQ36 to define the parameters of magnesium, calcium, and other concentrations in the alkaline conditions. So we've been using the standard methanogen media composition known as DSMZ141, and we're keeping the concentration of CO2 constant at 60 micromolar and varying the total dissolved inorganic carbon. So by varying the inorganic carbon, we can keep the CO2 constant because on the graph I showed earlier, as pH increases, the amount of carbon dioxide changes. So if we vary the dissolved inorganic carbon to counteract that, we can attempt to keep carbon dioxide constant. And with that, we're going to solve for the upper limits of magnesium and calcium before precipitation occurs. So here's a little bit of a schematic of the work we've been doing. So we have our media with the compounds such as ammonium chloride, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, things like that. And with these compounds, we evaluate the amount of dissolved inorganic carbon that would be present at a certain concentration of CO2 and at a pH. And you can see in the graph above, as pH increases, the amount of CO2 decreases and other forms start to aggregate. So as a result, we want to combat that and make sure CO2 is constant. And then from there, we'll look at the concentration of the ions and determine which ions are present in the solution. And then we'll input all of this information we've collected into the thermodynamic modeling system. And we can see exactly where the precipitation um, will occur. And we can 
you can see magnesite and calcite in the bottom right. We want that to have no precipitation. So we input zero. And then on the output, it tells you that with this certain concentration of media that you make, there will be no calcite or magnesite precipitation. This is very, very useful. So we have some preliminary results. So on the left is the paper that we've been using as reference where they keep carbon levels constant and they use incrementally more amounts of calcium and magnesium. And we, that was a very good starting point, but it's not really translational because there are two variables that aren't really defined very clearly. So what we did is we held our CO2 constant to determine um, the function of pH rather than having variable calcium, magnesium, and pH levels. So by doing that, we can define our experimental conditions without mineral formation. And essentially, I feel like you can get the gist of that. We're basically trying to eliminate as many potential sources of variation as possible so we can grow these methanogens with the utmost understanding of how they work. So here is an example of some of the data we currently have. It is very, a lot of stuff on here. So I'll break it down a little bit. Um, so on the X axis, like always is pH. And then on the Y axis is ion concentration. In this case, it's calcium. And below the curve is where mineral formation is not favorable. So we want to keep our media below this curve. Any condition above it, saturation, for carbon minerals is possible. So calcite and magnesite could form. And as a result, we wanna stay away from that area. And same goes for magnesium. So from here, the orange lines are the previous experiment that we looked at where they held DIC constant and CO2 is variable. And the green is our future direction. So once we figure out exactly how to optimize the media, we are going to vary the amount of calcium and the amount of magnesium to see if there's a certain metabolic requirement for these ions because the whole time we're trying to eliminate possible precipitation but we also have to consider that precipitation may be essential for the growth of the microbe because it does exist in the environment and it's always going to be next to a mineral in real life so we can't necessarily just say oh let's remove the mineral and see how it grows because that's not realistic so Eventually, we will get to studying precipitation, but right now it's just such a confounding variable that we can't really understand anything in its presence. So hope that made sense, but I wanted to give a big thank you to Alta, Dylan, Tori, Mike, Chris, and the entire exobiology branch at NASA for having me this summer, and thanks everyone. I'll open it up for questions. Awesome. Great job, Nate. Um, as always, you can ask questions in the chat or raise your hand and I can call on you. Um, I have to say, I, I think for Sanjoy and I, ha both having a lot of experience with um, these chemical reactions and the serpentinization system that you're looking at. Um, for me, you know, I, I was part of the Rock Powered Life team, even though I didn't do that directly. You know, I spent many years hearing about these things. Um, but one thing that, that comes from my personal research that I wonder about um, is what happens when you start adding organic carbon and you start adding microbes to the system. You know, right, right now you're modeling you know, the inorganic system, but what happens when there is some organic carbon present? How does that then alter uh, the concentrations of magnesium and calcium? And maybe more importantly, you know, in, in my system, I, I was studying organic carbon itself seemed to be a driver for the processing of, of sulfide into sulfur um, and making minerals. Um, does organic carbon and does having having life in the system, do you think that will, will, will greatly change the chemistry of the system that you're looking at? Oh, for sure. Um, it's really easy for us to try to look at all these things and get caught up in the complexity of the system. But for now, we're trying to simplify it as much as possible because we don't really understand much of the system. So we're looking at, at very simple terms right now, but as we understand more and more, we're going to introduce more and more variables so we can get closer and closer to environmental conditions. But for now, it's just we can't, I don't think it's possible for us to consider true environmental conditions because we don't really know what's influencing what. But that I also had that question when I started because I'm like, the microbe's not going to exist on its own. There's obviously going to be other things in the environment. Yeah, but, um, all models are wrong, but some models are useful, right? 
Exactly. <laughs> so uh, how about Sanjoy? What do you think? Yeah, so I agree with that statement. Um, so EQ36 is a thermodynamic equilibrium code. And the carbonate system in the natural environment is uh, not often in equilibrium. Uh, for example, seawater has a pH of 8.2. But if it were at equilibrium, the pH would be closer to 7.8. So there are some elements in the natural system that forces uh, the carbonate system to not be in equilibrium. I'm not sure how that translates to, uh, to more dilute fluids like sulfentanized fluids. It's something to keep in mind that yeah. your model is not going to give you exactly the concentration you need for your experiment, right? Because yeah. it's going to be and a little bit off. There is. And, uh, uh -huh. I was going to say there is a little bit of an inherent flaw in the system where we only add the magnesium and calcium at one time point. So we add it in the beginning and then the micros basically use that one dose the whole time. But in C2, it would have access to magnesium and calcium like continuously so it could access it. But it's just difficult for us to continuously be adding it. And also, it's just, there's a lot of variables. So we've been, we've been having a little bit of trouble exactly figuring out what we need to prioritize over other things because there are so many conditions. Yeah, it makes sense to me to remove the magnesium from your system. But the reason why serpentinized fluids are alkaline to begin with is because they're calcium rich, right? There's no yeah. CaOH minerals to pull the, the, the Yeah, I'm actually running down. Yeah, I'm running an experiment right now, actually, where we have very low amounts of magnesium and we're seeing what's happening and it is not growing. So it's only growing at high amounts of magnesium. So that is a great thing to say because we aren't exactly sure what magnesium is doing. So. Hopefully we'll figure it out. Yeah, so we're almost to the break. I think we have time for one more question. There's a question from Anaru, um, and this is a good job for you, Nate, to try to explain what you mean by precipitation here um, oh, yeah. in the case of your model. If by precipitation you mean microbially induced calcite precipitation, do all the methanogens found in such environment have MICP capability? Um, I believe so. We. It's not necessarily a biotic process that is mediated by the microbes. It might necessarily just be like an abiotic thing that has happened in the past that the microbes have adjusted to. So, sorry, I'm trying to understand exactly what you mean by that question. So are you saying, are you asking if the microbes themselves carry out the precipitation? Like, are they capable of induced precipitation or I, I think from a more yeah, so what I meant yeah am I audible? Yeah you are yeah so uh, during the talk you mentioned that you are encountering problems as in precipitation is happening. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if microbes are causing that or it's an abiotic process that's happening and uh, it has some other factors. I I believe it's an abiotic process that's happening that the microbes have just essentially evolved to coexist with. But I can never be like super sure about anything I've learned from research, but that's what I believe. Yeah, because uh, in nature, we see this process called MICP, mm -hmm. where microbes produce like precipitate mm -hmm. minerals outside of them, like calcite mainly, and they entomb themselves. So yeah, it I, becomes spores at the end of the process. I know that happens in like cyanobacteria. So I'm gonna, I'm actually going to write that down right now and look into that. That is a great yeah. task. <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah uh, there is. On a route, we do have to go to the break here in a minute. Um, just for a very general yeah, explanation. Okay. So his model is not looking at the biological system, but it, it's considering the, the chemistry of the fluid. And at a certain point, when you have so much calcium and so much carbonate, they will precipitate together abiotically and make calcium carbonate. And that's what we were seeing in that model. Understood. Thank you.